Well, thanks everyone for joining us uh, this morning on this chat about 1031 exchanges. It's one of those topics that I think a lot of uh, folks out there have heard about, but don't know a whole lot about um, why they should do them or you know how the process works and all of the details to know about. So um, we've got a great little panel today. Uh, we have Leonard Spoto, who oversees all of the sales and marketing operations for Asset Exchange Company. He's a frequent keynote speaker and also an accredited course instructor on the subject of 1031 tax deferred exchanges. He's presented his popular real estate and tax workshops to over 12,000 realtors, lenders, title professionals, and investors. And he's also the author of dozens, if not more, uh, published 1031 exchange related articles. And prior to all of this, uh, to co-founding Asset Exchange Company, he worked for a major national title company, uh, affiliated exchange company. And also joining us this morning, we have Tamara Dow, who is a fabulous escrow officer at Stewart Title Company. She has over 16 years of experience in the real estate industry, starting in 2004. And uh, she's worked as a transaction coordinator, realtor, escrow assistant, and now escrow officer for the last three years. So I'm going to hand things off to my fabulous associate at Soul Property Advisors, David Guzman, who recently completed a 1031 exchange with a client of his and Leonard and Tamara's help. So take it away, David. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. We're excited about um, bringing this content into uh, Santa Cruz County. I think a lot of agents uh, can really uh, benefit their clients by knowing what exchanges are and how to use them and who can really benefit by them. So, um, so Leonard, uh, what I'd like to do is, is start with you. And I know that uh, you, uh, you do these uh, webinars on a regular basis, like up to a couple of times a week. So uh, you could completely fill this time with your expertise and knowledge on your own uh, so I'd like to uh, stay out of the way as much as possible. And, um, and also, Tamara, if you want to just um, uh, chime in on, uh, on a topic, uh, feel free to, uh, to just speak up and uh, join the conversation. Uh, we're going to kind of keep it loose. And um, the idea here is that we're talking about the, the basics of 1031 exchanges, what they are, who can do them but um, we shouldn't be uh, uh, hesitant to ask um, more uh, complex questions about the process as well. Uh, this is our, a great opportunity to hear from, uh, from both of you and your expertise. So, uh, so Leonard, uh, can you just uh, describe for the layperson what is a 1031 exchange? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, um, we just accomplished one, right? So um, David just worked with us to, to do one for his client. And um, basically, 1031 exchange is a provision within the tax code that allows an investor to defer the capital gains tax liability on the sale of an investment or business use property. So um, here in California, we have clients who have quite a bit of gain. Um, if, held, if they've held property for any amount of time, that property has appreciated if the property is an investment property, options when they go to sell the property, either number one, they pay a big tax bill, or number two, they use the provision within section 1031 of the tax code to defer paying capital gains. So simple tax deferral mechanism, you sell an investment property, you do a 1031 exchange to defer taxes by going out and buying another investment or business property. So uh, say investment property, so this is not for primary residences. Yeah, absolutely not. So different tax code govern um, different types of real estate sales. So section 121 is the tax code that relates to the sale of a primary residence. Um, you guys are probably familiar with that. If you live in a home for two out of the past five years, when you sell that property, you get to uh, avoid paying taxes on up to $500,000 of gain if you're married, 250 if you're single. So completely different tax codes for different types of real estate, right? Um, 1031 only for investment and business use and then section 121, the homeowner's exemption for the primary residence property. 
So, so how does it work? Person has an investment property. Um, wh at what point do they contact you? Yeah, good, good question. So um, they contact me early in the process, hopefully. Um, Tamara probably knows that sometimes people call us the day before they're closing escrow, um, right? Probably had clients at the closing desk say, wait a minute, uh, what's this withholding tax? Why do I owe it? And how do I get out of paying taxes on it? Uh, can I do a 1031 exchange? So, uh, you know, the sooner in the process that they contact us, the better. Um, although, like I said, I mean, we can accommodate rush transactions. We have some people at the closing table ready to sign and they will, uh, they will contact us. We can get an exchange account set up for a client anytime before the closing. Um, but it's imperative that we get involved before the closing. If the closing occurs and the clients receive the funds, um, it's a taxable transaction. So within the tax code, it actually says you cannot be in what's called constructive receipt of your sale proceeds if you want to do an exchange. So if Tamara wires out funds to a client and then they decide, oh, geez, I want to do an exchange, it's too late. They're paying taxes. Oh, is someone singing? <laughs> oh, you guys heard that too. The room went off. <laughs> okay, so uh, so the uh, the transaction that that I did, uh, we identified the property before the uh, the relinquished property. The the uh, I was representing a buyer, um, and so she had a property to sell that she was exchanging uh, to buy something else. So that. Uh, property that she's selling is called the relinquished property, if I am correct. And uh, and so we identify the replacement property uh, before that transaction closed. So um, she was uh, very uh, uh, savvy with the process and was worried uh, about waiting in this in this market. Can you talk about that dynamic a little bit um, when? When should you start looking for your replacement property? Or how does that all fit together yeah. so you don't lose out? Yeah, yeah. The single greatest challenge people have in doing an exchange is finding suitable replacement property to exchange into. And David, you know the market is bonkers right now, right? So I actually spoke with a, a realtor outside of Sacramento who got 103 offers on their property. So imagine if you're in an exchange and you come in and you're offer number 104. I mean, it's just not going to happen, right? So um, the problem with an exchange is you're going to sell a property and the only way to defer that taxes is to go out and buy another property. Um, what further complicates the process is when you do an exchange, you have a very limited amount of time frame to locate the property and also close on it. So the government gives us 45 days to identify what we're thinking about buying and a total of 180 days to purchase and close. So you're gonna sell a property, you're gonna buy a property, but you have to do it within this very compacted time frame. So um, the best thing that you can do is what David and his client did is know what you're gonna buy ahead of time. Now there is a little bit of a chicken and an egg though, right? So you wanna sell your property and then you wanna purchase in that order because that's the easiest way to do the exchange. It's the most cost-effective way to do the exchange. Selling a property and then buying is called a standard or a delayed exchange. And again, it's the easiest way to do the exchange. What happens a lot of times with our clients is they'll sell the property. They have no clue what they're going to buy. They go out and they look, they get, you know, outbid on everything and they end up failing their exchange because they can't find something to close on. Um, the best thing to do is not to do that, right? The best thing to do is when you're selling your property, know what you want to potentially exchange into, or at least the type of asset that you want to exchange into, the geography, have a couple backups. And while you are in escrow to sell the property, you can go out and start making offers, right? So I think that's probably what you guys did, right, David? You guys tied up the replacement property, you had a long escrow, and then in the meantime, you were able to get your sale or your relinquished property closed. If you do that, you're going to increase the chances of success. Everyone's life is going to be easier. The last thing you want to do is close and then scramble around for 45 days with no clue of what to buy and be the 104th offer on a property that you have no chance on getting. Yeah, that's right. And make we made offers prior to the sale of my client's relinquished property. 
So when we were submitting offers, there's the, um, the exchange uh, document. So at the very beginning, we had to say that the property that was being relinquished was not an escrow yet. So we disclose that and uh, we do a, a sale contingency, of course. So um, as time goes on, that property got into contract. So our offers changed and we said, instead we said um, that the property's in contract, but it's still a, a sale contingency. And, uh, and then again, time went on further and we um, sold the pro that property sold. And so our offers said that it was all cash, it became all cash. Um, I should say it was all cash the whole time, but there was that sale contingency. Right. So knowing as time goes on, how you need to approach your offers is extremely important. And so um, to my fellow agents, knowing this process uh, will help to make you more competitive in a very highly competitive marketplace when you're doing this kind of an offer, um, especially because of that uh, sale contingency aspect. So, uh, David, so how, Leonard, oh, go ahead. How, how long after the close on the sale did you guys close on the purchase? Uh, we did it in, um, in under a month. It was about 25 days. Yeah, yeah, that's a great exchange. And, uh, you know, in this market, the people that we work with that are completing their exchanges are doing exactly what you're doing. So uh, kudos to you. It's, it's challenging to do an exchange right now. So the fact that you got a, a successful exchange completed, that's a uh, testament to your hard work and, and lobbing, you know, good offers in on lots of different properties. Well, I, I appreciate that. I had great information uh, from your webinars that, that, uh, that you give a couple of times a week. Um, maybe you can let us know where we can access those, those webinars. Yeah, we, we do webinars, um, like David said, several times a week. We teach a basic class, an advanced class, uh, kind of a, a problems and pitfalls class. We also teach a class for realtors on how to grow their business using 1031. And all those classes are posted online at our website, so ax1031.com, so www.ax1031.com. So that helped me to really uh, get up to speed with the exchange process. Um, the information is just, it's just top notch and it's very easy to understand and then uh, convey. And the, the safety net for all of that is the fact that um, I believe I've heard you say, put your number on speed dial. <laughs> and you, you basically become part of the team. And if there's a, because we have to be careful um, the nature of information that we convey, right? Because of uh, uh, we don't, we're not allowed to really give tax advice, and this is a whole tax-related issue. So we have to be careful um, how we phrase things. So we can just have uh, we have you as our uh, terrific resource. Um, you guys are, are, were great about answering the phone, about uh, being available to answer those questions when needed. Yeah, thanks. And, and really, that's kind of our role. We, we do process exchanges, but we are more of a consultant on how the whole process works too, right? Um, we've actually started really to, to kind of help people to think strategically early in the process and what they want to buy and give them referrals to different markets as well. Some people are set on buying in a certain town and, you know, there's only 120 listings available in that town. So, you know, think about different towns, think about different geographies, think about different asset classes. And, you know, that's how you're going to have a, a successful exchange. So we're here to guide you through the process on the exchange uh, rules and regulations, but also, you know, thinking long-term, where do you want to be in 10 years? What kind of asset do you want to be in? And then uh, can help you with that as well. So um, the process talks about a like-kind exchange, but like-kind has a very broad definition, doesn't it? You just alluded to that. What are some of the other um, uh, uh, types of properties that you, that you can invest in, in this process? Yeah, I mean, the good news is you can invest in anything that's real property, um, as long as it's used for business or investment purposes. So we have um, some clients who will sell, most of our clients sell rental homes. 
that's probably the bulk of our business. Um, but we have clients who will buy land, um, they will buy office buildings, commercial property. There are new products, and, and they're not even that new. They've been around for about 15 years now, um, where you can actually buy a slice of a very large institutional grade property. Um, so really, you know, you've got all kinds of flexibility on the type of properties that you trade into. You just have to use those properties for business or investment purposes. Um, you could go anywhere in the country. So you could sell in California. We have a lot of clients who buy in Texas or Idaho. Um, one of my clients this morning asked me if they can exchange into an Airbnb property. And that is absolutely allowed. Um, anything that's going to be deemed kind of a, a vacation rental, you need to be careful not to use it personally too much. Um, but a vacation Airbnb that you're renting out uh, and you know, you're reporting that rental income, that's absolutely going to work as well. So a lot of flexibility in terms of the asset class that you can exchange into and a lot of flexibility, you can go anywhere in the country. So we could um, uh, talk to a potential client that is sick of, say they're sick of being a landlord. They don't wanna be a landlord anymore, but they want to exchange out of a property and put it into something else. So you're saying that there are other types of properties that potentially it sounds like they wouldn't have to manage. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, you guys might be familiar with the, the term triple net lease. It's a commercial term for you know a type of lease where the tenant um, takes care of everything essentially. Um, and there are commercial brokers who specialize just in those type of properties. An example would be in, uh, a Walgreens or a Rite Aid or a Chick-fil-A. Um, you own the building, but the operator Chick-fil-A manages all the problems and, and issues with the property. So some of our clients will go into those type of properties. And then there's also um, big $50 million apartment buildings that some of our clients go into and they just own a tiny little slice. And those are structured as what's called Delaware statutory trusts. And some of our clients go into those. Um, they're not ideal for everybody, right? Because some people, you know, they want to manage, they are hands-on, they want to do the work and increase the value of the property and, and make a bunch of money when it sells. For some of our older clients who are just looking for passive investment income um, without the day-to-day -day management, those triple nets and those DSTs are, uh, can be good options. So, so in the process of identifying properties, it might be a good idea to diversify what types of properties you're identifying to give yourself a better chance. Yeah, a lot of times what people will do is they will nominate two properties um, as their first and second choice, and then they'll have a, a backup, which is one of these triple nets or a DST or something like that. So uh, I don't know if you mentioned this before, uh, but that reminds me how many properties need to be identified in this process. Yeah, good question. So as I kind of alluded to earlier in the discussion, on day 45, you have to identify. Um, there's two methods to identify. The most common method is to submit three properties using the three property rule. So you get one, two, three bites at the apple. You're going to nominate your first choice and then two backups. So three properties on day 45. Um, some of our clients, though, they're trading out of a million dollar property and they're going out to Texas and they're saying, well, geez, I can buy 20 properties in Texas with my million bucks. And how do I identify you know, more than three properties? There is another way that you can fill out your identification letter. It's called the 200% rule. And the 200% rule does not limit the number of properties. So you can identify 20 or 15 or whatever, as many as you want. There's no limit on the number. There's only a limit on the value. And that value is 200% of what you sold. So if you sold for a million dollars, 200% of that is 2 million. You can identify $2 million worth of property in Texas. And like I said, that could be 20 different properties in Texas. Okay, terrific. I'd like to bring uh, Tamara into the conversation. If you could unmute, unmute yourself. Um, question for you and our uh, transaction with uh, Asset Exchange Company. Um, Tamara, you are a great part of the team. How did you find the whole process to, to go? Was it rough? Was it smooth? It was, um, how was it dealing with, with asset exchange? Uh oh, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it was really smooth. Everything went great. We didn't have any hiccups in the whole process. I mean, it just closed as scheduled and um, no issues whatsoever. I haven't had any hiccups in the past either, so. 
everything Great. went uh, right along. Okay, that's uh, I knew the answer to that already. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's why I asked with such confidence. But um, how, Tamara, how is an exchange escrow different from a regular escrow? Well, um, that depends. You know, the party exchanging is technically not considered the buyer or the seller, but the exchanger instead. So the exchange company is substituted under the escrow contract and executes you know, a portion of the documents um, as the buyer or seller, while the exchanger reads and approves certain items, um, statement, escrow instructions, et cetera. Um, if our exchange is our buyer, most of the time, like in your case, they'd already sold the property, um, the exchange company been holding their funds and are just using the proceeds to um, you know close the current sale so um, you know that helps defer the capital gains into a future date so if we have a seller um, with the exchange uh, they generally send the exchange company the proceeds and um, you know go through the whole process that way uh, there's a few different ways it could go you know depending on the situation so lots and lots of details. Yeah. In our uh, transaction, the buyer was also in a trust. And I think, yeah. uh, the, I think the seller was also in a trust as well. So there were, um, there were uh, exchange, there was exchange information, there was trust information. And obviously because of the tax implications, uh, everything has to be just right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know that's obvious, but, um, I just am appreciating the level of detail that goes into it uh, to sort it all out. And I, I'm glad I don't have to be the one to make sure that all happens uh, myself. Um, and then, so Tamara, um, what, how does it work when um, the buyer has to put a down payment and the relinquished property hasn't sold yet? So, um... In some cases, the exchange company already has the proceeds, but if not, um, you know, the buyer can put in the initial deposit, but at the end, if there's enough money in the exchange to fund the entire purchase, usually the exchanger can get their deposit back. Um, we just have to do like a separate line item showing, you know, the refund to the exchanger and make it very clear uh, what it's for. Um, so there's no question as where the funds are coming or going from. And um, yeah, let's see, you know, oh. other times, you know, if there's enough money in the exchange that the exchanger will get a portion of their deposit back to fund the, trans, uh, or they'll need to fund um, more of the transaction on their own. So it just oh, kind of okay. depends what's left in there. Right. And Leonard, what are the implications of, of that? Uh, the buyer puts in their own funds, uh, close of escrow, they get some of those funds back, but what if they have to put in, what if those funds are kept and, and other funds are needed that were not covered by the exchange? What, it, what does that mean? Yeah, um, it's not an issue. Um, the exchange, the exchanger can always add more cash to the transaction. Um, a lot of times what happens is what you're describing where a client finds a property uh, and needs to put a deposit down and we are not yet holding funds. So they're gonna have to use their own cash. And then once we have a funded exchange account and we're in receipt of the sale proceeds, we can reimburse the client for any out of pocket earnest money deposit that they had to put down. So um, sometimes they don't want a reimbursement and they need to just add more cash to the transaction. Um, either way is fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, uh, when do, the tax implications uh, kick in. Uh, and what I'm referring to is boot. How, do, how does that work? Yeah, so boot is when there's leftover money. Um, so if you've got a million bucks sitting in your exchange account and you buy something for 950, so we send out 950 to Tamara, her escrow closes and we've got $50,000 left. And we say to the client, well, are you gonna go buy a second property? And they say, no. So you've got $50,000 left over, that's boot. Boot is taxable, and um, we actually have to withhold on that as well. So we'll cut a check to the California Franchise Tax Board for three and a third, and then send the rest to the uh, to the client. 
And then the client's going to reconcile when they file their taxes with California, but then they're also going to owe federal taxes as well. So um, boot isn't necessarily bad, right? A lot of people think, well, geez, I absolutely have to spend every penny in my exchange account. And that's not the case. Um, you can always have some money left over. It's just simply going to be taxable. Now, having too much boot can be a problem because at some point, if you have so much boot, you might end up paying all of your taxes. So we always uh, kind of have a conversation yeah. with our client when we see a lot of money left over. We say, okay, um, you know, if you're if you have too much money left over, there might 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 not be any value in even doing an exchange. So it's always a good idea for us to kind of have a good conversation with the client on what their goal is, how much they're looking to spend, if there's going to be boot, um, you, you know, so that we can advise properly. But um, boot isn't necessarily a bad thing. A lot of clients will, you know, have a little bit of money left over and just that money is taxable. It does not invalidate the entire transaction. Mm, okay. Very good. And, and I'm sure, Leonard, that you, from time to time, uh, these exchanges will fail uh, for whatever reason. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the reasons that that happens? Yeah. So we kind of touched on the most common reason at the beginning. You just can't find suitable replacement right? And it's always better just to pay taxes than to buy something you don't. I always tell my clients that. Um, but there's just not a lot of inventory right now. So the most common reason why exchanges are failing is because they just can't find something to buy. Um, another reason, and actually, I dealt with this yesterday with a client. Um, a client was, uh, you know, she had 1.2 million in her exchange. She planned on buying a, uh, a replacement property. We had no clue what it was. Um, we got in touch with the replacement property provider, and it turns out she wasn't buying real estate. She was buying shares of an LLC, and it, you can't do that in a 1031 exchange. When you do an exchange, you sell real estate, you have to buy real estate. And um, now the LLC, the underlying asset that the LLC owned was actually a winery, and it was a business, and she was hoping to become a member of this winery through the 1031 process. And you would think, well, geez, yeah, I can invest in a winery in a 1031. Yes, you can, but you actually need to own the real estate. Um, you can't buy shares of the LLC, which owns the winery. Okay. So that's one reason um, why, it, you know, things kind of blow up is um, people just don't understand the rules. We, we got this file in late. We didn't have uh, time to talk. To her. She located the, what she thought she wanted to buy. Um, and hopefully her exchange, you know, won't blow up she has still time left within her 45 days to identify something else but uh you gotta buy the right type of property yeah makes sense uh any other uh issues that you're running into um you know those are big ones i mean usually it comes down to finding suitable replacement property um within that time frame the biggest challenge right now is 45 day 45 days is going to go really quickly and if you can't find something within that time frame, um, but we don't really see exchanges fail for technical reasons, um, although they can. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of a technical reason: someone buys a property and they move into it right away. Oh. Now, it's not necessarily going to uh, raise a red flag for us. We're, we're not going to know that the client is going to move into the property if they don't tell us. Um, but upon an audit, an IRS agent's going to come and say, "Well, geez, this completely." fails, you're going to have to pay taxes, we're going to disqualify the exchange, and you're going to have to pay penalties and interest and fines. So um, technical reasons um, why an exchange will fail are numerous. You're, you know, you move into the property, you didn't season it long enough, things like that. Um, but we're not going to necessarily know that that's going to be uncovered in an audit later by either the Franchise Tax Board or the IRS. So um, that that's a big one. Um, we, we did get a question from someone uh, who wanted to do an exchange. They sold in California and they wanted to buy in France. That doesn't work, right? So you have to stay in the United States. Um, we uncover those things usually in time to save the exchange. Usually those kind of things are uncovered uh, when they first give us a call before they've even closed. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't happen during the exchange where a client says, well, no, 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 I'm going to buy in France. And we say, no, you can't. And all of a sudden their exchange is, is blown. But uh, those kind of things usually come up early in the process, luckily. That's, uh, that's good stuff. <laughs> good stuff right there. So that's a, a lot of the, the, the how 
in the process, but how about um, more of the why? Um, so the tax uh, deferred aspect of it, of course, is a huge part of it, but what kind of a strategy might somebody be doing uh, when they are relinquishing a property and getting into another one? What, what's the end game behind yeah. that? Okay, well, we'll see if- It's like Leonard froze for a second there. <laughs> Deep in thought. <laughs> there he is, okay. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> we can hear you. All right, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, the end game for a lot of people is, is different, right? Everyone's got their own ultimate end game, but the, the reason why you're doing an exchange, it kind of it falls into several different categories. Number one, you just don't wanna pay taxes. And here in California, if you do uh, cash out and you close on your property without an exchange, you're going to cut a check to the government for about 33% of your gain. And that could be six figures for a lot of our clients. So number one, they don't want to pay taxes. Um, but there's other reasons, right? We have clients who are looking to build wealth. And they're saying, okay, well, I own one rental. I would like to have a lot more than one rental. Uh, so I'm going to go out and... Uh, exchange into a very large apartment building that's going to cash flow better. And the best way to build wealth through real estate is not to sell the property, taxes, but it's to keep all of your money working for you and going out and leveraging into a bigger and better property. So number one, they're trying to build wealth. Number two, uh, they're trying to protect what they have. Um, some of our clients are already very wealthy and they're just looking to diversify their wealth, right? I mean, imagine if you have all of your real estate tied up in San Francisco and there's an earthquake you could be out of luck. So some of our clients use the 1031 exchange to diversify into a different geography, right? We've got a lot of stuff that we're worried about in California. We've got earthquakes and wildfires. So um, you can diversify your portfolio to protect your wealth um, by going into different geographies or different asset classes. Um, a lot of people also, and this is kind of uh, uh, the last reason, a lot of people just want to simplify their life. Managing real estate is difficult. And uh, we always joke in our industry, when you own real estate, you've got the terrible T's. You've got the toilets and the tenants. <laughs> and if you're 80 years old and you've been dealing with that for your entire life, you just might want out and you say, okay, I'm done. But the problem is you don't want to pay the tax bill. So a lot of our clients who are in that kind of situation, they will do an exchange into something that they just don't have to manage or something that's just easier to manage. So there's a lot of whys and it, you know, it really... Uh, varies depending on the client's uh, particular situation, but those are kind of the, the main reasons why we see clients do 1031s. That's great. And we have clients with all of those different needs. So uh, to be able to sit down with them and figure out how best to, to help them uh, really brings value to, uh, to our industry. So thank you for sharing that. We have a couple of questions from uh, the studio audience. Liz, do you want to go ahead and... and uh, Sure. I, I apologize if we might have touched on these already, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, things didn't get missed. So the first question is, what is the process for turning a primary residence into something that qualifies for a 1031 exchange, assuming that the property is now rented to someone who doesn't own it? Yeah, so we have people who do that all the time. They live in the property, they move out, and then they rent it out. Um, once you move out of the property and you establish the property as a rental on your tax filings and you do it for two years minimum, then the property is going to qualify for 1031 exchange. So um, th there is a very distinct advantage to moving out of a, of a home and renting it out because when it sells after two years of being a rental, you can do the 1031 exchange. But because you've also lived in the property for two out of the last five years, you can also take your homeowner's exemption. So we have people who live in Santa Cruz or Santa Clara that bought property 20, 30 years ago, and they paid a hundred grand for it. And it's now worth a million. It's a primary residence and they have gain in excess of their homeowner's exemption, right? So even if they sold it as their primary residence, they've got a tax bill because they have $900,000 of gain. And the most they can take out tax-free is 500. So people in those situations can really benefit from a strategy where they move out of their primary residence, 
They season the property as a rental for two years. They sell it as a rental and take a 1031 exchange, but also take their homeowner's exemption because they've lived in it for two out of the last five. So long-winded answer to a really good tax strategy for really mitigating your tax bill when you sell a highly appreciated home. Thanks. And then the, uh, the second question we had was in the event that the exchanger can't find a property, are there short term types of vehicles that can be invested in? If so, what is the holding period for the alternative investment? There are not. Yeah, a, a property that you intend to go into for a short short term is inherently not eligible for 1031. So anything that is set up or sold to you as a short-term fix for a 1031 is going to inherently be ineligible for 1031 because what the IRS looks at is you need to have an investment intent and inventory or quick flips are distinctly ineligible for, for 1031. So um, we've had providers in our industry over the years say, hey, we have a solution for your clients. You know, we'll park their money for six months until they can find something in our real estate investment. And they've been disallowed every time by the IRS. So unfortunately, there is no you know, quick fix if you can't find property. There's no short-term solution. You have to find a true investment. You have to season that ownership of the new investment for at least two years for your exchange to be valid. Great, thanks. Well, those were the only questions that I saw pop up in the chat. Oh, <laughs> we just got one more, sorry, <laughs> spoke too soon. So in the rented former primary residence uh, example, what would qualify as like kind? Yeah, so um, you moved out of your primary residence, you put a tenant in there, you season the tenant in the property for two years, you sell that property as an investment to do the 1031 exchange, and now you're just doing a normal 1031. So you can go out and buy any other type of investment or business use property. So again, it could be a rental home, an apartment building, an office building, a piece of land, um, anything that you're gonna use for business or investment that is real property. Leonard, what if I sell my relinquished property and I wanna invest those funds in the stock market prior to uh, buying the replacement property? Can I, can I do that? Absolutely not. Yeah. The, the government does not allow you to have uh, what's called constructive receipt of your sale proceeds. So the funds are parked with an exchange company like mine until you're ready to buy the property. And I always kind of give people the, the sense of, you know, our business, we're kind of like your 401k company, right? You have a 401k, you get to invest in the stock market tax deferred, but there's rules on how you can touch the money when you can get it. Well, we do the same thing for real estate. Um, you get tax deferral on your real estate sale, but the funds have to come to us, the custodian, until you're ready to buy the replacement property. You can't direct me to put your funds in Google stock or anything like that. They're parked in a money market account, safe and secure until you're ready to reinvest into the new property. Hmm. Okay, any other questions before we wrap up for Leonard or Tamara? I think that's all I saw now, unless someone's fingers are feverishly <laughs> typing in the chat, but <laughs> yeah, we're, oh, we got one more. <laughs> Do you guys have time for one more? Yeah. All right. And uh, the question was, what about REITs or financial ownership? Yeah, so REITs don't qualify. Um, REITs are companies that own real estate. And when you buy a REIT, you're buying a share of a company, uh, an LLC or uh, some of their stock. So you're not buying real estate. So unfortunately, REITs don't qualify. Um, because REITs don't qualify, what the REIT industry did is they said, okay, well, let's invent a product that does qualify. So they came up with um, fractional ownership. And it is, um, we kind of mentioned this earlier, fractional ownership of big institutional properties is sold through what's called a DST structure or a Delaware statutory trust. And when you do an exchange, you can buy into a beneficial interest of the trust. And the legal minds over, you know, at these big institutional companies came up with this. They went to the IRS and they got a ruling that if it was structured the correct way, then uh, it would in fact qualify for 1031. So um, REITs do not, but the REIT industry does offer a similar product 
through a, what's called a DST or a Delaware statutory trust. So fractional ownership does work. Great. Thanks so much, Leonard and, uh, and Tamara. Yeah, that was just fantastic information for everyone and can't wait to share it with more folks. Very much appreciated. Thank you for your time and your expertise. Yeah, thank you for having me and for the opportunity to wear a collared shirt for the first time <laughs> yes. in a long time. And, uh, and Leonard, I, I shared your phone number in the, the chat section there, but uh, for folks who are watching, what's the best way to find you and, and get in touch? Yeah, so our toll-free number, 877-471-1031. Uh,